Having continued holding the consulship through the 85 and 84 BC years, Lucius Cornelius Cinna maintained control of Roman government, and the Marian faction, through thinly veiled threats of tyranny. He had become a type of monarch who pretended to follow the will of the people. Upon learning that Sulla had concluded the war against Mithridates, assumed the consular legions sent to kill him, and was making his way back to Italy, Cinna made preparations for war. Hoping to meet Sulla on foreign soil, Cinna transported his legions across the Adriatic. Unfortunately, Cinna's second group of legions were caught in a storm, and shipwrecked along the coastline. From there, the survivors simply made their way back to their homes. Disgruntled by the loss of half their army, Cinna's legions grumbled. They did not want to battle Romans who, outside the legions, were friends and family. Hoping to frighten the remaining troops into shape, Cinna ordered a general assembly, from where he meant to harangue and threaten them into capitulation. One source tells us that one of Cinna's personal bodyguards, known as Lictors, struck a soldier who was standing in the commander's path as Cinna made his way to the military rostra. When the soldier returned the blow to Cinna's Lictor, a stunned Cinna immediately ordered the man's arrest. It was illegal to lay hands on those appointed to protect members of government. When the men in the General Assembly saw the arrest taking place, someone picked up a stone and threw it, hitting Cinna squarely in the head. We are told that the spirit of the mob then took hold. Stones and other missiles flew through the air. Amidst the chaos and riot, a nearby soldier stabbed Lucius Cornelius Cinna to death. With the death of Cinna in 84 BC, and Sulla marching towards Italy with more legions than when he left, the Marian party turned to Cinna's co-consul, Nius Papirius Carbo. Carbo was the son of the Carbo who, back in 113 BC, had lost Rome's first engagement against the migrating Germans, which prompted the domination of the consulship by Gaius Marius. Hoping to bolster his forces in Italy, Carbo began a campaign to convince the Italians of Sulla's intention to revoke their citizenship and voting rights. This news was easy for them to believe because the process of placing the Italian Romans in balanced and fair voting blocks was taking much longer than they wanted. They had convinced themselves that the delay was part of a greater plan to strip them of their long-awaited and hard-fought progress. Because they believed Sulla was the main threat to everything for which the Italians had fought and bled, they quickly lined up to join Carbo's legions. Carbo then oversaw the elections of his consular successors for the 83 BC year. Scipio Asiaticus and Gaius Norbanus were both highly placed within the Marian regime, and both won their elections. Next, Carbo convinced the Senate, in which the Populares now greatly outnumbered the Optimates, to deliver its next senatus consultum ultimum. Lucius Cornelius Sulla was named an enemy of the state. Asiaticus and Norbanus were put in charge of protecting Italy from Sulla's advancing legions, then Carbo took his own army and marched for Cisalpine Gaul. By the spring of 83 BC, Sulla crossed the Apennines into Italy and was intercepted by the army of Gaius Norbanus. Norbanus, who was supposed to await the support army of his co-consul, Asiaticus, arrogantly thought he could take Sulla, and was quickly defeated. Norbanus, and what remained of his forces, fled to the town of Capua. Rather than pursue Norbanus, Sulla, instead, turned his army towards the oncoming Asiaticus. When the armies met, a large portion of Asiaticus's army dropped their arms and defected to Sulla, leaving Asiaticus to be taken prisoner. In order to show his benevolence, Sulla released the uninjured Asiaticus. Because Sulla had turned to Asiaticus, preventing the two consular armies from meeting, Norbanus, and a portion of his army were able to extricate themselves from the town of Capua. They immediately set out for Cisalpine Gaul to meet Carbo, who was marching his army into Italy to deal with Sulla. Unfortunately, Carbo and Norbanus combined were unable to mount an effective campaign against Sulla, whose constantly growing army refused to be lured into a vulnerable position. Turning sole command of his army over to Norbanus, Carbo returned to Rome. If the Marians were going to defeat Sulla, they had to be fully united, and Carbo had the perfect plan. Approaching Marius the Younger, Carbo offered to make the 20-something young man his co-consul for the 82 BC year. Marius the Younger, who the historians tell us sought to achieve popularity on the fame of his father's name, jumped at the opportunity. 
Not only would he lead his father's party, but would be the youngest man ever elected consul. And he would do so without having to obtain the prerequisite lower level magistracies required by both the cursus honorum and the mos maiorum. Carbo's strategy worked. The Marian party rallied full force to the banner of Marius the Younger. Even veterans of Gaius Marius's later campaigns came out of retirement in order to support Marius the Younger against the threat of Sulla. In a landslide election, which included a cousin of Marius the Younger's, and even Quintus Sertorius, as consular candidates, Gaius Marius the Younger and Gaius Papirius Carbo won the 82 BC consulship. With approximately 85 cohorts, or 50,000 soldiers, Marius the Younger set out for the Apennines. Carbo's army marched to the closer province of Etruria, where one of Sulla's lieutenants, Metellus Pius, was stationed. Carbo's plan was to prevent Metellus Pius from joining forces with Sulla by defeating him first, then joining forces with Marius the Younger to take down Sulla. Unfortunately, neither Carbo nor Marius the Younger were prepared for the wild card that was just about to insert itself into the war.